Welcome, my name is Jason Shapiro and I'm a Java instructor here at Intertech. And today I'm going to be talking to you about the Google Web Toolkit, also known as GWT. This presentation is going to be broken up into several different parts and this is the first part one. Now before I talk to you about uh, GWT, I do want to tell you a little bit about Intertech. Intertech was founded in 1991 and we provide both training and consulting opportunities. On the training side, we have classes for enterprise developers, and these range in technologies from Java, .NET, web technologies such as Ajax and web services, databases, and much more. The way that we deliver our courses is through two primary methods. We teach in-house here in Egan, Minnesota, but we also have a virtual classroom. So if you find that you're out of state or unable to get to our classrooms here in Egan, you are able to take many of our courses on the web. On the consulting side, we have experts in Java and .NET, and these roles range from developer all the way to architect. For more information on our training and consulting opportunities, please visit our website at www.intertech.com. As I mentioned, my name is Jason Shapiro. I'm a Java instructor here at Intertech. I have about 14 years of software development and architecture experience, primarily with web-enabled applications, and most recently focused on business intelligence applications. Now for this course, uh, there are some prerequisites. What you'll find is that GWT is a technology that allows you to program web applications in Java. That Java is then compiled and translated into JavaScript. So that means you're going to have to have a at least a basic understanding of both Java and JavaScript. If you would like to improve your skill set in any of these topics, keep in mind that we do offer many, many classes here at Intertech that cover this material. It'll also help if you have a basic understanding of servlet containers, but that's a little less important when compared to having a basic understanding of Java. Now everything that I'm talking about in this presentation, including the slides and code examples, uh, can be downloaded at the URL you're seeing on your screen now. That's www.oxygenblast09.com slash events.htm. To begin, we'll go over a brief AJAX review, and in this first part, that's where we will end. That'll help bring everyone up to the same page to understand uh, what are the benefits, what are the problems with AJAX, and how does GWT help us in this area. After we've done a brief AJAX review, we'll jump right into GWT. We'll talk about the benefits, how you install GWT, what are the major components, and then we'll look at a GWT module. Basically, a GWT module is a, a collection of widgets, a collection of things that you can put into a web application. So a GWT module can contain one or more uh, widgets for your web page. So when we look at the module, we'll look at its anatomy. What's the directory tree that's created when you make a GWT module? Where do all the different components live? We'll look at the shell and browser that's provided by GWT. These are special applications that will help you in writing and testing your GWT modules. And then we'll take a look at the compiler. The compiler is what's going to take your Java code and turn it into JavaScript. Following the GWT module, we'll do a brief review of MVC model view controller architecture. This is a architecture that we'll be using when we write GWT modules. And then we'll sit down and actually implement a simple GWT module. I'll talk about the design, how I'm able to select what widgets I want to have inside of my GWT module. We will implement the view behavior and that will make more sense after we go over our review of MVC. We'll add a little bit of style, uh, a look and feel to our widgets. When I say style, I mean that in a very loose sense of the word. I am most definitely an engineer first and an artist second or maybe even third. Uh, I'm sure many of you will be able to do a much better job at making your GWT widgets look great. Uh, but what I will be able to show you is how you're able to add the style to your widgets. 
what's the syntax of adding style. Then we'll go into the Ajax-ness of a widget. Uh, how do we communicate to the controller? What's the, um, what is the syntax of writing code that will allow your client-side widget to speak to something on the server and back and forth? This is known as GWT RPC. RPC stands for Remote Procedural Call. Then we'll look at internationalizing our uh, GWT module. Near the end, we'll very, very briefly uh, review some advanced topics. This will be more just to point them out to you so that you can do some research on your own, but to be aware of the emulated JRE. This is, a, um, this is the Java runtime that's used inside of GWT. JSNI is JavaScript Native Interface, and it's a way of allowing um, existing JavaScript that's outside of your GWT module to communicate back and forth with your GWT. And we'll also point out uh, JUnit and how that works with GWT. To better understand how GWT helps us build dynamic web applications, it helps to have a basic understanding of the evolution of web applications, what it was a traditional web application built, and what were some of the constraints of those applications, and how did AJAX help solve some of these constraints. So if you already have a background in AJAX, you could probably skip the rest of this part and jump right into part two. At the beginning of part two is where we will start looking at GWT specifically. So the rest of this presentation in part one will be a review of AJAX. So let's do that. Let's think about a traditional web application. A user uh, decides that they are going to visit a website, so they open up a browser, type in a URL into the browser's location bar. Maybe they type intertech.com, and what ends up happening is the browser takes that URL and forms an HTTP request. An HTTP request is just a simple protocol for containing all the information needed uh, to uh, make a request on a web server for a specific web page. So that request is created and sent across the wire and sent to a web server. The web server receives it, opens it up, reads through the request, and then tries to locate the resource that was requested. Once it's found the resource, it takes that, uh, in this case it'll be an entire HTML document or an HTML page, and it will put that into the body of an HTTP response. That response is sent back across the wire to the user's computer, the browser receives the response, parses through it, grabs that HTML, the markup, which is going to describe the web page, and then uses that to paint the web page onto the user's browser, right onto the screen. So that's a synchronous request. What ended up happening there is that we made a request, but we had to wait until that response came back. There wasn't really anything else we could do in between. Uh, so, in addition, the, an entire HTML document was sent back. It's typically not just a fragment of HTML or even um, a fragment of just data to be put inside of a web page. So we get this entire HTML document back. Now let's say a user wants to do something else on this page. Perhaps they want to uh, click on a link that's on the page. So they click on that. Another request is sent across the wire web server finds a resource, and another entire HTML document is sent back, which completely draws over the existing